All righty, all righty. I see everybody starting to join. We'll get started here in just a second. Uh, welcome to the Vector Choice webinar, protecting your business and your clients and get FTC compliant before tax season. Yes, uh, I'm talking to you, my CPA friends. Uh, I know busy season is coming up for you guys. So we'll get started here in just one second. All righty, all righty. So I see uh, people still joining. Uh, welcome to the webinar today. Um, uh, today uh, uh, brought to you by Vector Choice, protecting your business and your clients. Get FTC compliant before tax season. Again, yes, I am talking to you, my CPA friends. I know busy season is coming up for you guys. So we wanted to give you some uh, things to think about as you guys are going into tax season. Uh, today, my name is Will Nobles. I'm the uh, CEO of Vector Choice, and uh, I've got my guest speaker here, John DePero, Chief Compliance Officer here at Vector Choice. John, thank you uh, so much for being on today. Good morning, Will. Pleasure to be here. Yeah, and John, so so everybody knows a little bit about John. John is, uh, I would say he's the retired genius. Uh, that, that John, I'm going to uh, give you that name going forward, the re retired Does genius. I mean, I used to be a genius, but I'm not anymore. That, that's depending on how you take it there. <laughs> but uh, John is uh, uh, comes from a military background, uh, uh, was uh, in the U.S. Arm, uh, Army uh, Counterintelligence, uh, uh, working with the NSA and NATO. Um, uh, he knows compliance. Uh, he does the things that we all hate doing is reading a lot of fine print and a lot of uh, legal terms and translating that to compliance and what really IT needs there. Uh, so John is going to be a, a, a source, a, a wealth source of resources here uh, on this webinar. Uh, a little bit about Vector Choice and the team. Um, so uh, we got Mike Bazar, our Chief Techno uh, Technology Officer. Mike is my business partner as well. We got Sarah Sawyer, John, which you just met, and then also Bo Dickey, which is our Chief Security Officer. Our management team uh, makes up of Jake, John, Troy, Gabby, Brandy, and Emma. Um, they're the ones that takes care of all the day-to-day -day stuff in the business and make sure that our customers are happy uh, and we are actually taking care of everybody. Um, we, I've had a great honor to, uh, we actually just hit, John, we just hit 15 years yesterday um, uh, and uh, 15 years in business. And it's been a great honor because we have grown like crazy um, uh, over the years. Uh, we've made the Inc. 5000, I think the past four or five years now, I was uh, honored uh, in 2022 to get the Titan 100, uh, which is the top 100 CEOs in the state of Georgia. Um, so we've had we've had a, a chance to win a, all kinds of rewards there. And I appreciate the, the team to be able to do that. Uh, our location. So we are now located in Lubbock, Texas, uh, in the uh, west part of Texas there. Uh, but we have offices all over the place. So when you're talking about local, it doesn't matter where you send your check to. We are local to these areas. We have offices, we have employees, we're completely staffed in, the, in all these locations where we can service you uh, and everything uh, from these particular locations. We have customers all across the country in multiple uh, states as well. So John, why are we talking about FTC and, and why, why are we talking about it? What, what's the risk out there, John? That's a great question. We hear tons of talk about cybersecurity and ransomware and all these breaches and all these problems. And, and the fact is, the ultimate bill payer for most of these big commercial breaches is John Q. Taxpayer. It's regular people. So their data is being stolen. And businesses, large and small, have largely ignored or significantly underestimated uh, that risk. And the federal government has now stepped in. Uh, the FTC, just one aspect of saying, Hey, companies who have consumer data, you have to protect it. We're sick of you making bad risk decisions and affecting our constituents. So the FTC and many others, you know, there's HIPAA, there's other ones out there, but today we're talking about the FTC. They've created something called the safeguards. And in the, the nickel version is if you're a financial institution, and that's a huge definition to the FTC, but today specifically it identifies CPAs and tax preparers. If you are a financial institution, you must do about 20 to 24 different items in order to protect customers' financial data. And why would a CPA be on this call? Why would somebody be listening? Um, it's going to get expensive. The, a lot of companies have said, well, the cost of compliance 
is more expensive than the cost of non-compliance. So the federal government said, no problem, we can fix that. <laughs> we can make it way more expensive to be non-compliant. Um, and this is just the federal government's costs, right? We'll talk about class action and reputation issues later. Yeah, John, on the uh, 100, I see $100,000 per violation here, $10,000 uh, officer director. Now, what is considered a violation? And uh, uh, is it per, uh, you know, it, whatever the judge and jury per, say, it, it's whatever okay. that judge and jury say. And, and you know, it, it's kind of easy to laugh about now, but in, in Chicago, they have another a state level, but but a similar uh, thing around protecting people's biometric information specifically. And White Castle, of all people, were found to be violating it. They thought, well, that was a thousand dollars per violation, meaning like per every employee. And the court came back. The Supreme Court of Washington, uh, Illinois, came back and said, no, it's per violation. So that went from being a couple thousand dollar fine to a multi billion dollar lawsuit, right? So per vi violation will be determined by the courts, uh, but that's only once you're at trial. And I'll give you an example of what that could look like. If I put all my customer information in Dropbox, and I'm not knocking Dropbox, I'm not saying it's a good or bad product, but let's say I do it in a way that is not secure, or I use QuickBooks Online in a manner that is not secure. You say that movement of data was one violation, usually the courts are gonna say every time you put something in there, so how many times a day do you upload? How many times a day do you email? How many times a day do you back something up uh, to your thumb drive? Uh, most courts will look at every time you do it as a violation. Um, now, blood from a turnip, you can't, you know, if you have a five-person CPA firm, you can't hit them with $5 billion in fines, all right? It's a, you know, but, but the point is the fines are astronomically more expensive than the remediation now. And more importantly, it's also there's $10,000 that will be levied against the officers and directors. That doesn't mean you get to file bankruptcy or quit or, or do cyber insurance. These are literal FTC federal uh, assessments levied against people. It will follow you wherever you go. Yep. So, John, let's talk about uh, where FTC, before we even get into FTC, where did it actually come from? You want to talk a little bit about this? The, the roots of GBLA are from, uh, you know, the 100 years ago when our financial systems were falling apart and there was fraud and, and people weren't trusting banks and financial institutions. And then over the next few decades, so Graham Leach Bliley is, is decades old. It's very old law that regulates consumer financial products and services. Uh, it's important to note that the FTC safeguards do not apply to SEC regulated financial businesses, but they apply to everybody else that the FTC manages. Today, we're talking about CPAs, tax preparers, but it includes things like uh, auto dealers, travel agents, um, something called finders, which is one that's going to blow everyone's mind. We'll talk about that later, but it, it's hundreds of thousands of businesses around the U.S., uh, are going to fall under the FTC safeguards. Yeah. John, we got a, we do have a question. By the way, guys, if anybody has any questions, please put in the Q&A and we'll, uh, we'll be monitoring that to get to you. So we got a, qu a question from Tim here. Is there a FTC.gov link that uh, states these fines or is there something that has to be? Um, yeah, you know, yes, there is, but I, I've got my screen, so I can't get to it right now, Tim. Let me send it to you. Okay. All right, so we'll we'll definitely get that out if you guys have uh, that concern or those questions there as well. Um, safeguard rules. So let's let's dive into FTC safeguard rules, John. Um, it, you know this is a a, a a legal standard, federal standard. So talk about uh, this a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. The again, the nickel version is you've got customers' information as a CPA or what have you. Um, it's on you to protect it. Who decides acceptable level of protection? Well, the FTC is saying, well, we're going to create some minimums. Uh, these aren't recommended recommendations. These aren't guidelines. These aren't, it's not a framework. It's not ambiguous. They're giving very, very clear guidance as to what firms are required to do to protect, to reasonably protect consumer information. Yeah. 
And John, th this is the, the next slide here just blows my mind. Because uh, I th think about financial institution, I think about CPAs or accounting or, or you know, hedge funds and stuff like that. But some of these things where they fall under, it's amazing. Uh, and, and, and talk a little bit about this as well. Oh, there's, I mean, just like I said, it's hundreds of thousands of companies, people who aren't currently thinking of themselves as also financial institutions, right? So you, you, the stuff on the left side of this, uh, this slide is what people are thinking. I'll shift to the right. When it says automotive dealers, now the FTC specifically called out automotive dealers because they knew automotive dealers have been subject to a lot of compromise and they're very hesitant to upgrade their technology. But what, it, aside from literally saying automotive dealers, that really says organizations that provide or arrange for financing, right? Real estate agencies, uh, non-operating uh, leasing companies. An operating leasing company is something like a Hertz rental car where they're operating the, the equipment for you. You just have the car for a couple of days. We're talking about like if you lease a tractor trailer for your farm, uh, if you lease heavy equipment for a factory, uh, if you if you have a website, and there's something they call the finder. If you have a website, and on your website, we, have, we had a client we we're talking about today, uh, Will and I, that's one of our customers. They probably don't consider the FTC safeguards applying to them because they're a veterinarian, but their website says, hey, shop. And when you click the shop link, it takes you to a different company's website for e-commerce. Well, you can make the case that, that that makes you a finder, meaning you're someone who use your platform to bring it together, buyers and sellers of services, even though you're not involved in a financial transaction. It's a massive definition that I won't beat up today, uh, but it's hundreds of pages of law to define this. Um, but so John, talking that, about you know, CPAs. Yeah, and I know we're talking about CPAs, but I want everybody, and especially the wire transfer and the finder, uh, let, let's use a, for a few more examples of those. So a wire transfer, if I am a, my company, if I do a wire transfer to another entity or I accept wire transfers, does that make me fall into this category? Yes. If you regularly transfer wire transfer money to and from consumers, what's the difference of, what's the definition of regular? Again, that's going to be up to a judge and jury, right? Um, but I think you know as a business owner, is it regular? Uh, if you say, no, we only do it once a year, my retort would be, but do you do it once every year? So then you do it regularly. You do it once a year. Um, so that is a huge one. A lot of people don't think about just how you're getting paid. Uh, forget credit card rules and, and other banking rules. The fact you wire transfer money to and from opens yep. this up for you. And John, on, on the finer's piece, uh, uh, a few more examples. I know we use the veterinarian, for example, but if I am, if I have a website and I'm publishing to sell a widget and I didn't develop that widget, but it's uh, uh, let's use IT, for example. Let's use my, you know, Vector Choice, for example. If I'm selling a Dell computer on my website, but it's a link to my distributor, okay, to for that, is am I a center of finder at that point? I'm not going to say it depends because the non-answer doesn't, nobody good. But with the limited information you just gave me, you meet the definition of a finder. Okay. Um, and you'd have to be compliant with FCC safeguards. Very nuanced okay. question. But Yep. And, and guys, and, and if you have any particular questions, uh, we're going to have a link where you can schedule a 10 minute, you know, a time with John to a ask him for follow up questions and stuff. If you have concerns like the what if situations uh, and everything, we can definitely help you with that. Now, John, I hear this a lot, especially from our smaller uh, CPA firms. Um, you know, I'm too small and we, uh, we hear this all the time. You know, I'm too small to get compromised. I don't have enough money. Um, you know, I don't need to worry about cybersecurity. I don't need to worry about this compliant or this compliant and uh, so forth. Um, so let's talk about companies that are that they they feel that they're too small uh, meeting this and defining this uh, this uh, definition here. Sorry, mute didn't unmute. So the the FTC does say if you have under five thousand consumer records. Um, I'm not going to get into a super nuanced debate about what constitutes how you score that 5,000, right? Uh, we can have a, a sidebar if someone thinks that 
they're borderline. But let's just assume for today's discussion that you only have one customer and you only have one record for them. That's it. Like you can't be smaller than one, right? You're a one person CPA with one record. There's only one, two, three, four, four items that you don't have to do. A lot of people think, well, I'm under 5,000. They don't apply to me. There are four items that don't apply to you. It's the risk assessment being written, your pen test and vulnerability assessments, the written incident response plan, and and doing a report and writing to your board of directors. Yeah, if you guys are busy, if you guys are busy writing that down, we're going to show that here in a second as well. Yeah. Everything else in FTC safeguards still applies to you. I don't care if you're one person, because it's not about you. It's not about your business, actually. I, I was on a different webinar the other day and someone said, Who's looking out for the, the little guy in this? Let's say actually this is literally designed to look out for the little guy. The little guy being the, the consumer, not the company who's failing to protect their information, right? Yeah. So John, and and and, and I you see there's two words here, customer and consumer. Um, and I think that's where I really want to point out here to everyone is that a lot of uh, you know the CPAs we've talked to are like, hey, we don't have 5,000 customers, right? And I want to be clear that it's not 5,000 customers. And John, you used the scenario, if I have one customer and they have 1,000 employees, that technically is 1,000 consumers and, uh, uh, from that standpoint. Is that is that accurate statement? I would have said employees. I'll give you a good example, one that is 100% true. Um, across the street from me is a direct marketing printing firm, right? They they only have five or six customers, but they have tens of thousands of consumers that they have their data on, that they do the marketing to, right? So their number of customers is five or six, but they have consumer data for tens of thousands of company people. Does that make sense? Because yep. they're the so, printing company, they do the marketing. So if you do fall under this, you know, make sure it's not number of customers that you direct customers that you have is all the data of, of multiple people or consumers um, that you could have inside that one customer. Yep. And yeah. I don't, I, we don't need to go down to every rabbit hole on, on the short webinar. If you, if you're unsure if this applies to you, um, reach out, reach out. We're going to talk a little bit about the qualified individual. Uh, so we're going to circle back to this in a second. Yep. And uh, John, I got a few questions here for you. So David asked, the screen says 5,000 consumers. Discuss said 5,000 records. Can you clarify? Uh, would 10 tax records for a single client be one or 10? It depends how you received it. I mean, if I, if I have an image that shows one PDF that shows five receipts on it, that's one record. If I have five receipts, that's five records. And, and guys, let me let me just say this. I have a QR code coming at the end. Let's maybe save our question. Let, let's go through this and then we can do questions at the end because some of this is going to get answered and some of it is, I, I think, specific. And we can maybe uh, use my QR code and, and we can jump on a call and discuss it. Yep. Okay. All right. So, John, um, you know, what... What is it important to businesses here? I mean, for especially financial institutes, we're talking about CPA accounting. I know it affects a whole uh, wide range of uh, types of clients, but why are we talking about CPAs and accountants uh, today? Um, first off, the FTC specifically calls you out, right? Like car dealers. It's It looked at the hundreds of thousands of companies that this is going to apply to. And they said, there's a couple that are probably going to think that they don't need to deal with this. So we'll make sure it's really black and white and clear to them. Um, this applies to you. Second, CPAs have almost every piece of information you need to steal a people's identity, a taxpayer's identity. Um, the amount of damage that can be caused if the company that, that leases me my uh, uh, dishwasher, right, uh, the non-credit, like maybe they just, gave me 90 days same as cash when I bought a new dishwasher. If I didn't do a credit uh, application with them, uh, the amount of data they have is probably not significant. A CPA, uh, anybody who's extending credit or arranging 
for credit, meaning putting you and the, the, the credit institution together, you have an amazing amount of consumer data that, that hackers and bad actors want. And it can be, I mean, think about what happens if, if, if I got all your financial info around tax season, Will, I can bankrupt. I mean, I can have life destroying consequences. I mean, you might not be able to make medical bills. Uh, you might, like it can really ruin a consumer's life to have bank accounts emptied and their identity stolen. Um, and that's why the FTC is stepping this up and, and enforcement starting already. And John, why, why are we talking about this now? I mean, you know, FTC has been around for a few years. Uh, why are, why in 2023, in a 2023, are we actually talking about FTC safeguards today? Well, that, the, the current FTC safeguards took effect in June um, of this year. June of 2023, correct? June of 2023. There's no more extensions, no more I'm getting to it, no more we have a plan. Um, those who kick cans down the road, the end of the road was June. So if you haven't gotten compliant with FTC safeguards, you're past that. Um, tax season's coming upon us. Uh, the end of the, the fiscal year for, for calendar year-based companies is is right i mean right here probably starting to get ready for it already uh the next six months is kind of going to be the, the heightened time for people to be intercepting emails phishing attacks i mean this is the busy busy season starting for tax preparers and cpas um, so if you haven't gotten this stuff fixed by now it's probably a really good time to at least take a look at having a plan for it yeah, and John, how about if, if people on this call that are not CPAs or not accountants, but they obviously, everybody, and I, I know I use, we all use CPAs, right? What are the questions we should be asking our CPAs? Let's um, do Let's do this. Them? Let's go through what you have to do first. And okay. then the questions are going to be natural. Okay, right? all right. So let, let's talk about upcoming, tech, you know, the problem that we're, you know, that the the financial institutes are, um, you know, running into, right, is uh, getting hacked daily, affected millions of people's information, uh, and it's just going to get, keep getting worse. We talk about cybersecurity. We talk about uh, leveling up in your IT and your security needs, multiple layers of security. Um, you know, John, it's like just the same thing as uh, I come into my house, right? I got cameras around my house. I I, I walk in the door, I lock the, the bottom lock, I lock the deadbolt, I can set the alarm, uh, I've got a dog, and I've got a gun, right? <laughs> Multiple layers of security there. Um, and I think what we're really getting to is very specific when it comes to compliance and security, very specific of what the CPA and tax preparers have to actually do. Well, that, that's a great analogy. And let's remember, security and compliance are related, but they're really fundamentally different things. Example, yep. I know your dog. That ain't doing you any good for security, right? <laughs> that dog ain't help, you know. But but if 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 there was a security checklist that said you have to have a camera, you have to have an alarm, you have to have a dog, you could check yes on the box. You have a dog, right? Yep. Um, but those of you who are on a lot of calls with me, you know my dog. He's a shepherd, and he will rip your face off, right? So there are different levels of both of them are dogs, right? Yep. Um. Oh, so compliance is not about necessarily securing your environment and preventing anything. When we talk about FTC safeguards, a compliance program for it, it's for you to be able to look to the government, to your customers, to the lawsuits, to your insurance companies, to your state regulators, and say, I was doing everything I was legally obligated to do. I was doing everything correctly. This is not negligence. This is not willful uh, disregard for the law. I was doing it, right? Whether you got Will's dog or my dog, the FTC saying you got to have a dog, right? And it's a list of about 20 things, ballpark 20. Yep. So let's talk about those uh, 20 or so things here. So here are some of the tools, right? Remember, you know, it's really a business solution or a compliance solution that sort of encompasses all this. Uh, but let's talk about the tools real quick, John. Yeah, so first off, these are kind of bullets, um, not full definitions, right? So let's not get too deep dive into the difference between uh, a pen test or a VPN. You know, like, But these are what the FTC is requiring you to do. Uh, MFA, uh, uh, VPNs for remote access. You have to encrypt all data at rest and in transit. 
And if you choose to put consumer data in a third party vendor, you're still responsible for making sure they're encrypting it at rest. So if you want to use Bob's cloud service, not Dropbox version of Dropbox, right? And they say it's encrypted, it's on you to make sure it was. If they get compromised, move it is a is a Dropbox competitor. And I, I only mention Dropbox because people have heard of it. It's not an endorsement or, or criticism. But move it was recently compromised. Um, states, and I, I mean like nation states, had lost data. Canada health system lost a ton of data. They got absolutely destroyed because the data was not actually encrypted correctly. They said it was encrypted, but it wasn't. They are all responsible for what happened in that ransomware. And well, it was ransom, but first it was stolen, unencrypted. So you don't get to say, I put my data in this cloud service. It's not my fault what happened to it. That is not how any of the courts are working. You chose to put it there. You should have made sure it was encrypted properly. Same thing with MFA. Well, I'm using this third-party auditing tool. Okay, but you have to have MFA if you're putting consumer data there. It's on you to figure out how to do it. It's not the government's problem, right? And it's definitely not your customer's problem. So, John, I think two things people might be wondering here is, one, if the assumption, if I put it in the cloud or if I put it in an application, a hosted application, my I am good. I can wipe my hands and I'm good. Do I need this stuff? Even if I'm using a tool that's cloud-based, do I still need this stuff? Um, absolutely. It, it's third party and vendor management is a huge part of, of the of information security program, right? Um, you so, cannot... so pretty much, it, I think the misleading of that it's in the cloud, that it, it takes the responsibility of everything that's in my office off of me. Not at all. No. no. The fact is, this data is valuable. If I'm your customer, Will, and I hand you a diamond ring and I say, I'm going to pay you to clean it and to polish it. And I expect it back in a week. And we sign it like we have a deal that's good. And you go give it to uh, your bank to put in a safety deposit box. That would seem logical, right? And that bank gets robbed and the ring is gone. Who do I sue? You're going to sue me the, that you gave me the ring. I'm not saying you can't sue your bank, Yeah, but I'm suing you. So yep. if this is a compliance issue, if you were required to ensure that my ring was encrypted, what you chose to do with it is that's a lawsuit between you and them. You're still responsible for it, right? Yep. And so I'm assuming, let's say we're putting things in the cloud. I'm assuming a customer can come and, and ask that third-party vendor, can you show me proof of X, Y, Z, right? Can you show me that you've you've done the proper measures? Yeah, and that's why some companies charge $100 for a license and some charge 50 and some are free. Sometimes you get what you pay for, right? Microsoft, yeah. we all use, I'll say we all use Microsoft, right? They're very good at shared responsibility matrices and attestations of what they're doing for what level of service you're paying for, right? This is why Windows Home Edition is a lot cheaper than an E3 or business premium license because you don't get a lot of that stuff, right? Yeah. So uh, if we're doing your Office 365 environment, right, there's many different licensing levels, right? As, as those of us in IT know, and maybe a CPA doesn't know all these different things. They just went to Best Buy and got, they just thought all Windows was Windows, right? This is why one of the most important features, uh, and we're going to talk about them in the next slide here, I think, is having a qualified individual to manage your information security program. The first thing they tell you you need is a qualified individual. So I'm guessing that FTC learned something from HIPAA where, you know, the HIPAA officer in a small dental practice is always, you know, the office right, administrator yeah. right, who has yep. no training in HIPAA and no training in cybersecurity and no training in compliance, right? But that's who's responsible. And then things don't go well. And that poor lady sitting there going, I didn't know this. And it's not her fault, right? The booger was proverbially flicked at her. What the FTC is telling you is you have to be a qualified, you have to be qualified to manage information security program. 
Uh, and not just today, actually, when you get into the, the full language, it says you have to make sure that person's staying trained and current because the industry is always changing. Cybersecurity is always changing, right? Yeah. So, you know, I, I, the previous slide, I said, but, right, the 5,000 consumers, this list here is even if you're under that 5,000, if you're a CPA firm with one client and one record, right, you're still required by FTC to maintain these line items here. OK, I think that's the important piece that a lot of people forget. Like John said earlier, only a few of them are not required if you're under that 5000 consumer. But these are still required. And this uh, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, John, uh, all this wording is coming straight from the FTC um, uh, site and everything. Correct? Verbatim. Verbatim. And let's talk. So, you know, you, you talked a little bit about the designated qualified individual. Right. What really makes a person qualified? And, be, you know, so besides saying, okay, I'm the owner or I'm the practice, well, in a, a healthcare practice administrator, but I'm the office manager, what makes them qualified? That's a great question. Actually, we talk about this a lot. I think the FTC did not want to endorse specific certifications like SEC Plus. Uh, they didn't want to put a certain level, like you have to be a CSSP or CISM. I don't think they wanted to endorse, because those are all run by private companies, right? Uh, nor did they want to put some kind of degree requirement. I think essentially what qualifies you as an individual is that you've had formal training and you've had experience and that it's reasonable um, that a jury of plumbers and soccer coaches and stay-at-home moms and retirees and, you know, normal people <clears throat> would look at your the qualified individual's resume and say, yes, it's reasonable to assume that that person knows how to manage all the tasks that are below on this list. What is not reasonable is someone who's been running a roofing company for 20 years and is really good at roofing. There's, yep. there's no reason I would think that you understand how to create and manage an information security program, right? And where, where does this come in where we talk about overseeing service providers? Um, where, where does that really come in and what does that mean to the CPA firms out there? Well, it's kind of the FTC has also already predicted a defense people, you know, they, they kind of already figure out what people are going to say. And I, again, I think that I think. They looked at HIPAA and saw why does HIPAA fail? Because everyone just blames their cloud service provider. You don't get to just blame. The FTC specifically says it's your responsibility to oversee your service providers, whether that's your managed service provider, like Vector Choice, whether it's your uh, accounting software provider. It's your job to make sure they're doing their job right. You chose them. Of all the companies on the planet, you went with them. It's your job to oversee them, right? So picking the right service providers matters. Yeah. So, uh, John, and this may be a question that might be too specific, but David's got a question here. If a customer has direct relationship with Intuit, I'm assuming they're QuickBooks. Uh, I'm just going to hyper, you know, assume here. They control my access. So if, let's say David's the CPA and they control the access. Uh, to their account, is there still liability when the relationship with Intuit is direct, not through the CPA? Yes. And uh, and David, get at the end, there's going to be a QR code. Uh, let's you and I talk more. I'm assuming you're a CPA that is um, doing work for, uh, you know, a company that just needs extra help, right? So email me at the end. You'll get my email here, David. The nickel version is you forget that you have to encrypt at rest and in transit. Uh, and there's some things about um, the machine you're using to access their their environment. So simple answer, yes, but call me. We'll, we'll yep. walk through it. No. And, uh, and so and I do get questions. Uh, is this being recorded? Absolutely, it's being recorded. It will be published out to you guys. You guys go back and watch. It'll be on our website as well uh, for that. Uh, okay, so, uh, you know, how how to comply with the new standards, CPA firms and, and, and for accounting firms. So what, what do they need to do to actually comply? The first, first, first thing you need to do, and I, I know it's a bullet four on here, but the first thing is you need to have that qualified individual identified. 
everything else fails after that. you can't do anything else right with you know it's like saying what's you know we're gonna create a football team I would, I would probably argue the first thing you need is a coach who's gonna you know put a team <laughs> together and come up and play right so or you're gonna create a new company the first thing you want is a ceo or a president you know some leader right anything you're gonna do you need the the person who's going to be in charge of doing it identified. Once you've identified that person, you need to understand what data you have, where it lives, how it's used, right? You need to understand um, what your obligations for that data are. And we're talking about FTC safeguards today. There's other, I mean, some of them overlap, like the IRS's tax prepare, um, the online tax prepare uh, standards. Uh, understand all your obligations. And one thing a lot of companies shoot themselves in the foot with is not disposing of things properly. If you don't need it, get rid of it. Stop trying to secure it for the rest of life. Once something doesn't need to be stored anymore, get rid of it. And, you know, people don't think about all the places they have their data. Well, they say, well, we've got MFA. You can't log into a computer without MFA. And, you know, we got everything in our, our OneDrive that are uh, uh, in the, let's say it's 0365 and everything's in SharePoint and you got to have MFA to get to SharePoint. So we're, we're good here. And, uh, you know, we do red team testing, you know, we, it's, it's a separate issue. I go to every time. Well, I go to lap, Best Buy, I buy a laptop from Best Buy and I go to 0365 online and I can almost always log in through the online portal without MFA. And like, oh, we didn't think about that one, <laughs> right? Well, like, you, you, <laughs> yeah. And because because this is not what you do. Back to your qualified individual, right? Uh, the reason guys like me and Bo can typically get around your stuff so quick because we've been doing this a long time, right? Spent years at the NSA. I probably have seen your security techniques before, <laughs> right? Like, and we know what are good and what are bad. And this isn't about security again, right? This is about Am I doing all the things the FTC says I have to do, not from my opinion, but from the opinion of people who wrote the FTC safeguards, from the opinion of a judge or jury who are going to define if I was being negligent or, or if I willfully disregarded it. Um, and, yeah, and, so, and, and disposing as well, uh, John, uh, for this in a secure manner, I think that even goes down to the actual hardware piece of it as well. You know, make sure that the hard drives are disposed properly inside the computers and stuff. And we'll go into technical piece of that, but that's something that you need to be paying attention to as you uh, decommission old equipment. Uh, John, we got we got a question uh, here. Uh, do you uh, do you have a written security plan template for your clients? Uh, we do have a written security plan, but it, it may need to be updated to meet updated requirements. Yes. Uh, so that's one of the things that we do uh, for our clients and is we do compliance as a service, okay, uh, where we can act as this for you. So you're a qualified expert. Um, we're going through. Um, so if you look at. Well, well I was going to, I don't know what Anonymous does. Right? I don't know if they're a CPA. Um I, I like their operational security. I like the fact that they're staying anonymous and not like admitting that, like something. I, I'm actually a big fan of what they're doing. Um, the simple answer is, yeah, of course we have written security plans. That's what we do. Um, if a company needs help updating theirs, get on my link and I'll be happy to talk about it. Yep. All right. So what are the risks of not being FTP? Uh, you know, what what are the obviously we talked about the penalties, right, John? Uh, we talked about the financial side of things. But how about, uh, you know, a lot of people forget their reputation uh, out there. Uh, you know, what happens in your community, in your city, in your town when you actually do get compromised? How does that hurt your business? And then and, 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 and class action uh, lawsuits as well. Uh, John, you want to uh, talk a little bit about that for me? Yeah, we had a slide earlier about the financial penalties that come from the FTC. Um, but, you know, the fact is the FTC only has so many people who can do investigations and issue penalties, and there's hundreds of thousands of companies in the U.S. Um, the odds that you'll get hit with an FTC fine might be low just based on that math. But here, the problem is, you know, when a plumber decides to take square and credit card payments, and so, he, you know, to make it easier on his customers and his, his phone gets hacked or left in an Uber and there's a problem, you know, when he's in front of that judge and jury, 
And he says, I, you know, the website for Square said it was secure and, you know, I don't know. And, and iPhone said it's encrypted. Like I didn't know. I thought I was doing everything. It's a real sympathetic message, right? Like it's a plumber who's just trying to take credit cards on his phone to help his clients out. When you're a CPA and your entire industry knows about the FTC safeguards, you can't go to a CPA trade show event website without somebody met an article about FTC safeguards and you're not compliant. You don't get to say it's because you didn't hear of it. You didn't know the, 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 the other attorney is going to make the case that you were trying to be cheap instead of compliant. You were trying to save money instead of protecting your clients. You were trying to prioritize profits over your legal responsibilities to consumers. It's not going to play well for a jury. It is just not. In fact, you're not going to trial because every lawyer on the planet is going to have you settling as fast as possible. Um, there's a huge difference in these class action suits for industries that are regulated and are told exactly what they need to do and choose to ignore it versus industries like a plumber who's just trying to do his business and doesn't understand cybersecurity. Finally, that reputation damage. I, I use Uber as an example. Uh, those of you who know me know my travel schedule and, and will schedule too. Like we travel a lot, but I won't use Uber. I won't use Uber. They didn't just have a security breach. They lied about it. And their chief information officer was literally sent to prison over how bad they lied and hid the information from the government and the insurance companies and their, their customers. I will never use Uber again. Uh, I won't buy Volkswagen. Not, not I wasn't going to buy one anyways. But because they literally had institutional fraud about their what their emissions were. And it's not necessarily that I care if it got 24 gallons or 26 gallons. It's that I can't trust anything Volkswagen says about their cars, right? Whether there's zero 60 time, or, you know, which I think is just eventually. But I can't trust anything Volkswagen says. They got busted out for lying and being fraudulent in their compliance programs. So those are two big companies. Um, I, I just can't do business with people that I can't trust. Um, and and our most, you know, we're the same way. IT, you know, five, six years ago, it was just a commodity. It's just this thing. I just need email. I just need a file server. It's become commoditized. I, I don't find it impressive for us to tell our clients, hey, every time you hit send out an email, it'll probably get where it's going. It's just assumed that IT works, right? What people really rely on Vector Choice for is that we understand their business goals and that we help them make informed risk decisions and help them stay within acceptable level risk. Not saying bad things will never happen, but the bad things happen outside of the window you were okay with, right? Or I should say within the window you're okay with. If that yeah. stops being true, we lose that trust, faith, and confidence, right? We have that same reputation damage. Yeah. So, John, uh, you know, and before I go to the next slide here, a, a lot of people say, well, there's a lot of compliance out there. So if and I'm I'm going to use New York, for example, right, uh, if a CPA firm in New York uh, that takes credit cards, they have to be FTC safeguard compliant. They have to be PCI compliant. They have to be the was it the New York safe harbor? Is that uh, what it's called? Uh, John, yeah. Back. Yeah, uh, Shield Act, Shield Act. Um, and also comply with their cybersecurity insurance. So you can have multiple compliance requirements. Uh, most companies do. Oh, yes, absolutely. In yeah, local state. Local state. Um, you know, what all uh, all states now have their own version of some kind of uh, uh, cyber act. Yeah, there's, there's not a state in the union that does not have incident reporting codified in law. Right. So even if it's just if this happens, here's what you have to do. Right. And they have specific people to notify and timelines. And um, all this gets back to your qualified individual. Right. Qualified is not. I worked at the, the big box electronic store doing, you know, setting up consumer TVs for a year. So I guess I can set up your network for you. Right. This gets back to qualified for your business. For the type of work you do, the type of data you have, the type of clients you have, who actually has the background to set up and manage your information security program for you? Yep. 
So you're, you're probably wondering, okay, well, how can vector choice help? Um, so one, we can uh, do help you meet your cybersecurity requirements. We can go and do a free pen test and a vulnerability scan for you to get a preliminary of what you have and what's going on in your environment. I don't care if you're a current customer. I don't care if you're uh, um, uh, someone that's just listening to this webinar or if you actually have a your CPA firm. You're like, I need my CPA firm to you know to get checked out um, to make sure that they're actually doing what they should be because you want them to protect your data as well. Um, we can do compliance as a service for you. So we can make sure we give you that key person. We make sure you're actually giving these reports where we can show that if, if something does get compromised, hey, you're, this company, this CPA firm was compliant at this snapshot of time, right? Compliance is a, uh, an ongoing basis. It never stops. So you can be compliant today and out of compliance tomorrow. So it's a snapshot of time. Uh, we can help you with your access control. We can help you understand the the laws there and and the, sort of the wording of the documentation that they have. Um, uh, we can help you uh, protect your data, the IT side of things. We can give you employee training and keep your employees trained up uh, to make sure you are meeting all these types of uh, requirements. So really, why does it come down? Why would you choose uh, Vector Choice over someone else to do this for you? One, we know what we're doing, period, hands down. We have a global presence in the United States. We can cover no matter where you're at. We not only know IT, right? You, you When you're talking to an IT vendor, you don't want someone that just knows IT. Like John said, IT is commodity. Anybody, I wouldn't say anybody, but anybody can do IT. Um, but then you got cybersecurity, layer of cybersecurity on top of that. You have to have experts to be able to understand and really understand the cybersecurity aspect of things. And then the third layer is that compliance piece, right? Um, do they have a chief compliance officer? Do they have a compliance team in-house? Um, do they even know what FTC is? I actually was talking to an MSP, um, uh, coaching the MSP, a managed service provider, that was backed by a CPA firm. Um, and the CPA firm or the uh, the IT provider did not even know what F uh, um FTC was. So, you know, do they know, are they able to talk the talk that you're actually going through and the concerns that you have? Um, you know, we, our quality of service is unmatched. Uh, uh, my team was telling me the longest hold time last week was 38 seconds uh, in our service uh, queue, the longest hold time. Um, so we're answering the phone very, very quickly to get you these answers. Um, we're making sure that you are compliant with the ever changes. I don't care if you're doing PCI or HIPAA or you've got a local state requirement. We're looking at all of that from our compliance team standpoint as well. So, John, I'm going to uh, throw it up here, ask any questions. i got a few more slides here left. But any final questions that you guys have for John um, that maybe we can answer while we're on the call again, um, we can uh, set up a one-on-one -on -one for you to talk to John more in detail about a custom situation. But I, um, uh, and while we're looking for questions to come in, bottom line, guys, just because it's in the cloud does not mean it's secure or backed up. Just because you don't have the data in rest at your office does not mean you're not required to do this. Um, you know, just because you have under 5,000 uh, uh, consumers uh, in your database does not mean that you're not required to do these things. Uh, the the unfor yeah. Unfortunately, you are required by law to do these things. And we're just here uh, sharing that message uh, to you guys. And, and again, remember, don't shoot the messenger, okay? But the FTC made this rule to protect citizens, not small businesses, right? The rule was not written with how much this will cost you in mind. It was written to what needs to be done to protect people. That being said, I know some of our CPA firms are that have gotten compliant are using this as a, a marketing tool, right? As a differentiator. Why you should hire them instead of the other firms. And I'll even help CPAs. Um, if your CPA reach out to me, I'll give you bullets like what you tell your prospects to ask your competition. If asked to see these three things, if they can't show it to you, they're not compliant, they're not protecting your data, they shouldn't even be a candidate for this proposal because they're not doing it right anyways, right? Uh, email me and I'll give you those three things.
Yeah. So, and that's where guys, you can use that as your unique selling proposition to your clients. If you're a CPA firm on here is what makes you different in the marketplace. Uh, I think IT and CPA firms are about the same. There's a, there's a dime a dozen, right? Um, but what makes you unique as a CPA? And I think John's uh, uh, bullet points will definitely help you there. If you know a, a CPA firm or accounting firm that needs this, or you're worried about uh, your CPA firm, hey, refer that to us. Uh, we will get uh, uh, get you some gifts there uh, and send your way as well. Um, and then final and, and last, if you guys are interested in just doing a call and talking to us about you know, the what if questions, if you want to email us info at vectorchoice.com, if you want to take us up on this uh, special today, a, a free assessment, a free pen test on your environment to see how where you stand, uh, and where we need to take you um, to the next level. Again, if you're a current customer or a, a, um, a, a someone on here that's just listening for the first time and didn't know who Vector Choice was, take us up on this offer. We would love to be able to uh, show this to you and give you some information back. Uh, again, I, I want to, John, thank you so much for being on the day. Uh, thank everyone for listening. John, I hope, uh, I hope everybody enjoyed John's uh Dic, uh, dictation of FTC safeguards. I appreciate it, John. Thanks. All right, guys. Have a good, wonderful day. Thank you.